I want to uh, give you greetings from Administrator Wheeler and, and EPA headquarters in Washington. Uh, we really look forward to these opportunities to go around uh, to various states around the country and, and tell you directly what's going on and cut through some of the noise in the press and give you our direct perspective. Um, so I know that EPA has been joining this conference for the last couple years and they, we've sent different folks. Uh, I think we're, we're on the third year you get the lawyer, uh, but I promise not to bore you with legal details. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it all high level and, and just um, focus on some of the, the key things we're doing, not only nationally, but here that have a direct impact on Kentucky's energy and environment. Uh, and as I get started, I'd, I'd like just to talk to you about the regulatory certainty we're attempting to bring to the United States through our deregulate, deregulation initiative that President Trump has initiated. initiated. Um, but as we do that, we're always working to protect human health and the environment. That mission is the primary mission of the agency. And the way that we have focused on that uh, nationally is accelerating the remediation of Superfund sites. We are continuing to finance critical infrastructure for uh, water and through our WIFIA program. We're working on uh, enhancing air quality by approving state implementation plans under the Clean Air Act and we're improving how chemicals are reviewed in the chemical safety review process is another important aspect of what EPA does. But uh, we are also very focused on deregulation and, and putting into place reasonable regulation that makes sense uh, and balances inter environmental protection and human health with our economic interests. And so in, we have already as an agency finalized 40 major deregulatory actions in the, the first part of this uh, term of this administration. And when fully implemented, those deregulatory uh, initiatives are gonna save $3.6 billion to the American economy, which is a tremendous uh, you know, burden that's been lifted. Um, but we're not done. Before the end of the first term, we plan to finalize another 49 deregulatory initiatives that's going to, we estimate, save another $100 billion uh, to the economy. So as a result, the, our economy is booming and optimism is surging. Uh, and I've heard stories already here um, in, in, in dinner last night that uh, it's surging in Kentucky. And we believe that by taking these actions, we're going to provide certainty not only to the state, but to the regulated community and to the public. And um, I, I uh, hadn't planned to talk about one of our initiatives that uh, with respect to uh, greenhouse gas tailpipe emissions, uh, but I, I, as, as uh, events unfold this week, I thought it would be relevant and poignant to talk to you about a special event that we had yesterday at the EPA headquarters. And um, I was able to join Administrator Wheeler and the Secretary of Transportation as we announced uh, that we will be revoking, the, uh, and we are revoking, uh, California's waiver to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from tailpipe, uh, the tailpipe for automobiles and trucks. And uh, this, this is significant, uh, I think it's nationally significant, and I wanted to t tell you some of the reasons why. Um, because I think there's a lot of misinformation in the press about our views on cooperative federalism and how we interact with states. And um, I, I, I want to get in a little, into a little bit uh, about the special, unique uh, uh, Clean Air Act provisions that California has to regulate auto emissions. And um, years ago when the Clean Air Act was passed, uh, Congress gave California a special deal because they had unique problems for smog forming pollutants. I mean, uh, smog in Los Angeles was uh, a notorious problem. It's part of the reason we passed the Clean Air Act in this country. And um, so we've granted waivers to California for many years. But um, in, in the prior administration, uh, a, a waiver was granted to do new automobile emission standards uh, in California to address greenhouse gas emissions and what, what we call the ZEV, which is uh, 
California's zero emission vehicles uh, mandate. Those are electric vehicles. So our, our announcement yesterday uh, took the step of saying um, EPA's waiver is going to be withdrawn uh, and the Department of Transportation has said that the, their, under their statutory authority that California's uh, ability to regulate GHG from tailpipe emissions is preempted because we want one, one federal standard and one national standard and that's the action we took yesterday. And <clears throat> this is being portrayed in, in the press uh, to some extent saying, well, you know, EPA has been around talking to states all over the country how we embrace federalism and how states are, should be more in the lead in, in our partnership with the federal government. Uh, but it's important to distinguish while we very much embrace federalism, that does not mean that one state can set national automobile emission standards for the entire country. And that's what California has been trying to do. Uh, it's the waiver that was given to California was specifically uh, tailored to their unique traffic problems and population and their topography and climate. And those, and those uh, issues are still there. What we're trying to do is put California's waiver back in the box uh, where it needs to be because California indeed has the worst air quality in the United States. Think about that for a minute. The, the, the state that um, is uh, promoting these sometimes uh, regulatory and burdensome uh, policies for the entire country itself has the worst air quality and, and, and we, we've measured that. So we want them to continue to focus on those local issues and let the federal government deal with national and indeed international issues related to, to greenhouse gases. Um, so you might ask, what's, what's motivating us to do this? Why, why is this so important for this administration and, and indeed the president? And um, well, we believe, and, and based on our proposals, that the average uh, American is, it, the ability to buy a brand new vehicle is, is slipping from their grasp and from their reach. Um, the average sticker price for a new vehicle in the first half of 2019 was $39,500. And that, that's out of reach for many American families. Um, the trajectory of these emission standards that were set in the prior administration and, and by California is going to make those costs higher. And in order to comply with those vehicle emission standards, uh, what automakers are doing is that, that, that they need to sell more and more electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles to comply with those mandates. Um, and right now, only three of the auto manufacturers domestically or internationally are meeting those regulatory goals. So, um, and as time goes on, we, we predict many of them will be out of compliance. So, by some counts, uh, we, there, there will need to be 50% uh, electric vehicles or more in the next seven years to meet the current auto emission standards. However, electric vehicles cost $12,000 more uh, on average, according to a study by McKinsey. And those costs uh, are not, we have to uh, pay for those costs somehow, and so those are being passed on to consumers. And, and um, but the problem is, despite all the push for electric vehicles and billions of dollars in subsidies, um, only, uh, they represent only 2% of vehicle sales in this country. And, um, so one way for the automakers to make up this gap and this difference is they raise the price of more popular vehicles like SUVs and trucks. And um, so in other words, American families who buy those vehicles are subsidizing the sale of electric vehicles. Um, and so automa automakers can sell those at a cheaper price. So it's one thing to subsidize electric vehicles through tax incentives, but it's an, a wholly other thing to ask middle and low income Americans to subsidize the purchase of electric vehicles uh, through, um, through the, the, car, the regulatory framework for auto emission standards. Of the, of the 57,000 households that received the electric vehicle tax credit in 2016, 80% of those had a six figure income. So I think uh, these families can afford an electric vehicle if they would like to purchase one, but they shouldn't ask low and middle, middle class Americans to pay for those. 
So um, we are, this is the action yesterday was a, our first step and we are uh, moving forward with it, an additional step to change the auto emission standards and put them on a more reasonable path and we'll be releasing that in the coming months. So um, that's, that's the biggest uh, news out of, out of Washington this week, but uh, I, I want to turn to other issues that affect can dr directly affect Kentucky's energy and environment uh, framework here. And of course, um, there's no bigger rule that, uh, that directly affects this state than I would say the Clean Power Plan repeal and our replacement of that, of that regulation with the Affordable Clean Energy Rule. This is uh, our attempt to directly reverse the prior war on coal. And we have delivered on this signature promise that the president made. In June, the, the administrator signed the final rule repealing the Clean Power Plan and it's now gone. Uh, we are getting ready to litigate that in the courts and so that, that's something I focus on day to day. But we did so uh, because, again, it would have been uh, a rule that put costs on low and middle income Americans by raising energy prices. And because of the significant harm, the, the Clean Power Plan had been challenged in court by 27 states, 24 trade associations, and 37 rural electric co-ops. And uh, I believe for that, in part, that reason, the Supreme Court did issue a historic stay and that rule never went into effect, which really gave us the ability to reverse that rule and uh, once President Trump was elected. So, so um, how are we doing this? I'll just give, I know there's gonna be more discussion about our ACE rule later today. And uh, you know, I know states are eager to move forward with submitting plans that would be approvable by the EPA and implementable. But I'll just say a few words about it at a high level. Um, the ACE rule sets what's called the best system of emissions reduction and an associated level of stringency for state standards. And um, we specifically outline in, in, we, in setting that, that the best system for fossil fuel uh, electrical generating units is heat rate improvement and it's not generation shifting. The prior, the prior approach was shift from coal to natural gas and shift from natural gas to renewables. Those were the two steps of the clean power plan. We have, we have put in, uh, we have complied with the law and made sure that the implementation of the best system of emission reduction is at the plant and it, it, it's something that can be applied to existing power plants. And um, it will make the, it easier for the, the state to take into account the plant's remaining useful life. And we've gotten a lot of questions uh, around the country of what that might look like. And, and um, under state plans, I think there's gonna be a lot of flexibility. We specifically de designed it, we've, we've turned a lot of this back and set the framework right for a federalism approach. And so states have to take a look at the fleet that of electrical generating units in your state see what the fuel sources are, see what the technologies are. We know to some extent that each, each power plant is a unique snowflake and they're, they're not all built the same. And so <clears throat> improving efficiency and heat rate uh, will look different at each plant. But that's, that's the, the work that the state will need to embark upon in order to determine what's an approvable plan by EPA. And um, we, we believe uh, that and we projected that once ACE is implemented, uh, the uh, CO2 emissions from the power sector will fall by as much as 35% from 2005 levels. Um, so I wanna pause there because that, that's really extraordinary because the Clean Power Plan had projected that CO2 emissions would fall by 36%. Uh, so we're right on, on target of really what the Obama administration was trying to achieve but we're not doing it through heavy regulatory mandates that interfere with the market. We're relying on the market and what it's already, what's already doing and we're coming alongside that and doing something reasonable that still is achieving environmental progress. It's also going to uh, achieve progress on the criteria pollutants, SOx, NOx, and particulate matter. Uh, so the bottom line is that ACE is going to continue environmental progress 
while doing so legally, more cheaply, and with a proper respect for the states and in setting state plans. I want to mention just a couple other things this morning. Uh, the, I, I would be remiss not to talk about our second uh, or, or uh, on par or equally most important deregulatory initiative, and that's the Waters of the United States repeal and replacement. Um, as you may recall, uh, the, one of the president's earliest acts was issuing an executive order asking EPA to reconsider the waters of the United States uh, definition that the prior administration had put into place. Um, the prior definition and, and the regulation, we believe, wasn't really about environmental quality. It was about power, and it was about shifting power from states and local governments and landowners and developers and farmers to the federal government. And so we are reversing that and trying to put the power back in the hands of, of states and landowners. And, uh, but it's been a long process. We, we have finally now re repealed the 2015 rule, um, in part because of the, the patchwork of jurisdiction that's existed around the country. Again, this was one that industry had and, and states uh, challenged in the courts and so it's been in flux for since, since 2015. Um, and so in 22 states, the 2015 rule is in effect. And in 27 other states and one, uh, one state that was in, in question, um, the 86 rules, the prior WOTUS rules were in effect. And that, you're lucky here in Kentucky, that's always been the case. You haven't had to grapple directly with the, the, the waters of the United States rule. But we felt very strongly this patchwork, uh, while we're developing our new definition, this patchwork is bad for the country. And we need to have one set of rules governing waters of the United States nationwide. Because as you know, rivers cross state borders. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't stay along political boundaries. Um, so, but, and we also knew that it was a job killer, uh, that some Midwestern states, farm bureaus for example, had estimated that between 95 and 99 percent of the land mass of their states could have been jurisdictional under the 2015 rule. And uh, at, that was just an impermissible, uh, at, we believe, overreach of federal authority. And so we repealed it based on three reasons. One, we don't believe the, the prior administration followed the Supreme Court precedent that dealt with these cases. Uh, we also believe that the prior administration ignored the express language in the Clean Water Act, uh, Section 101B, that requires that we recognize and preserve and protect the primary responsibility and rights of states to prevent, reduce, and eliminate pollution, and to plan the development and use of land and water resources. So the law is pretty clear there that states are the primary implementers of our Clean Water Act protection. And then finally, we even believed that there was potential constitutional concerns uh, over an, a federal overreach on states' inherent authority to regulate their own land and water resources. So we're continuing to push forward with our, with our replacement rule. We expect it to be out this winter. And um, I would say the most important thing that we've proposed there that to curtail and right-size the proper level of jurisdiction is that we're eliminating ephemeral waters or waters that flow exclusively uh, as a result of rainfall and not uh, that flow in a perennial or intermittent fashion as a result of groundwater. And uh, we, we believe by, by doing that, that, that respects the definition of navigable waters that's in the statute and that Congress never intended to regulate storm water uh, under the definition of waters in the United States in that manner. So um, keep, keep me a, ch a check on time, Secretary, if I'm, if I'm uh, I running long. But I, got, I wanted to mention just one more rule I think is, is directly relevant to uh, utilities and, and uh, coal-fired utilities. And that is our effort that is underway to take on another aspect of the prior administration's war on coal with respect to the Clean Water Act steam electric uh, generation effluent limitation guideline. And essentially, 
Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that, those are guidelines that regulate effluent streams coming out of, of coal-fired power plants. And um, it, when it was promulgated in 2015, uh, it established stringent limitations and standards for seven different waste streams. And the rule was projected to have $480 million uh, of additional compliance costs on these, on these uh, power plants that were affected. So it's another one that was heavily litigated. And in 2017, uh, EPA found that it was in the public interest to reconsider the rule. And we're reconsidering two specific aspects of the uh, steam electric ELG, as we call it. Those, uh, those aspects are discharges of bottom ash, um, transport water from coal ash impoundments, and flue gas desul desulfurization wastewater from uh, emissions that are captured from the stack as part of the scrubbers. So with those compliance deadlines fast approaching, the first step we took was to delay those compliance deadlines. And we promulgated a rule in 2017 delaying the deadline for compliance uh, from November 2018 to November 2020. And uh, I am happy to report to you that just recently in a case out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, we, that rulemaking was upheld and indeed our, our uh, postponement of those compliance deadlines is not until November 2020. But we are working hard at trying to amend the, the, uh, the regulation for those two waste streams and we expect to have our new rule finalized sometime next summer is the current projection. And, um, that's just another example of the, the efforts we had to take on a, on a legal, uh, in, in, in a legal way to try to give ourselves the space to revisit some of these flawed policies. So uh, in closing, I just wanna um, kind of bring back to, back to a higher level and uh, because sometimes as we, as we go and, and we talk about the deregulatory initiative, uh, you know, people and, and the press and others wonder what, what impact is that having on a national, in a national way and even an international way. And I think context is extremely important. It's, it's important for the American people to understand that we have made tr tremendous progress over the years in environmental protection. When the Clean Air Act was passed in the 70s, uh, Los Angeles smog was choking. When the Clean Water Act was passed, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio was on fire, literally because there were chemical spills that were igniting on the Cuyahoga River. We are not in that place anymore. We have some of the best air, air and water quality in the, in the entire world. So let me just give you some statistics to back that up. Uh, you, are, you are breathing, if, if you're alive today, you're breathing cleaner air than your grandparents ever breathed. And uh, that's, a, that's something uh, to be proud of as a nation. U.S. Uh, criteria pollution fell by 73% since 1970, which was when EPA was created. And at the same time, our economy grew by 260%. That's a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, the World Health Organization has reported that EPA, uh, that the United States has uh, some of the lowest ambient air pollution in the world, seven times below Chinese levels, of course, you know, China, I was just in Beijing a few months ago, and uh, you could literally taste the air there. Um, but uh, we are well below France, Germany, Mexico, Russia, and other developed and developing countries. Um, not only that, not, and that's just with the traditional pollutants, but with greenhouse gas emissions. This is a t statistic you'll never hear the media repeat, very, and you'll only hear it from uh, EPA and other sources. Um, greenhouse gas emissions fell by 12% since 2005 as our economy grew 17.5%. Uh, that, 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 so some, some of this, uh, these goals that, uh, that states like California want to achieve are happening through market forces. And we support that. Um, and the United Nations found that no other developed country in the world had decreased its carbon dioxide emissions more than the United States has. Um, it's another statistic that you won't hear very often. That's not to mention we have access to the safest drinking water in the world. 
and we're among the best countries with surface water quality in the world. Um, and with respect to energy related emissions, ours has, has decreased by about 14%, while global energy CO2 emissions has uh, increased uh, over 20% in the same period since 2005. So the, the, uh, the environmental protection picture is, is uh, rosy. We, we continue to protect human health and the environment while making reasonable decisions uh, for reasonable regulation that our economy can bear. So thank you for inviting me to this conference this morning. It's a real pleasure to be he here, and I wish you a great day. Thank you. Sure, happy to answer any questions that you might have. We need to get you mic'd up over here for the panel. Yep, right here. Uh, sorry, I'm blinded in the lights a bit. Yeah, well, uh, you know, we have to be careful talking about enforcement issues. Um, and, you know, one thing I want to emphasize is that we, we take enforcement very seriously. We, um, we follow the rule of law and we, and we try to implement enforcement on an even-handed basis across all our states. I think the president <coughs> has identified some significant uh, environmental issues in California. Homelessness and, and waste on the streets of Los Angeles and California is one of them. Um, wastewater uh, overflows from their sewage systems is another one. And as I've mentioned this morning, California has some of the er worst air quality in the country. You would never know that. But uh, they, have, they have many backlogged state implementation plans to try to clean up their air that haven't been implemented and acted upon. So. Um, you know, we, we understand the challenges that all states face, and we're working to address those challenges, uh, but, you know, we, we think that California should be looking after the local issues a, as much in, or more, more than it's looking after international or national issues. Other questions? Okay, okay. No, no uh, hardballs. All right. Okay. Thanks again.